Welcome back to the Metal Exchange. Justin and Chris back again. How are you, my friend? Uh, doing good, doing good. Um, excited to talk about uh, Ed Guy. It's always never a bad time to talk about Ed Guy for me. Um, and uh, excited that we actually have a website now. Um, yeah, and, let's start uh, with the let's start with that. How uh, how exciting is that after what over three years or whatever it's been? <laughs> Yeah, many thanks to the uh, on podium uh, server who uh, kind of did, did a lot of the work for us by going through our Spotify and kind of pre-populating all our previous episodes uh, into a, a, a free website um, that is really quite nice. And, and I did a little bit of um, customization, and uh, I'm in the process of, of kind of updating some of the. Um, album art and stuff, but uh, you can find it at metalexchange.onpodium.co for the time being until we actually get ourselves a a legit domain name, but um, it, it's pretty nice. Um, it's uh, I think it, it really like or, it organizes things in a nice way. You can um, play the episodes from the website. They're embedded uh, into the into each individual um, page, so um, I would keep an eye on that for, uh, you know, the episodes should be uploaded at the same time that they go up on Spotify, which is typically 6 a.m. Eastern time on Monday mornings. But uh, I, I thought it was really neat. Um, it, it, there's links to all of the different podcast apps, the RSS feed, our social media. Um, so it's kind of bare bones for now. It'll probably expand in the future, but it is exciting to actually have a website as unimportant as that is um, compared to, you know, what it would have been in like 1997 or whatever to have a web, a web page, but uh, it, it, I'm, I'm really happy with how it looks. So um, I definitely wanted to mention that. When you were doing Halloween fan pages back in the day, you didn't even know what a podcast was. So it's kind of funny how far we've come in 25 years. Yeah, I used to I used to make websites on members.aol.com and and uh, yeah, I, 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 we don't really talk about it too much, but I, I was co webmaster of the uh, the Halloween Future World site, which was probably the second most viewed Halloween website besides their official page. Um, and then unfortunately, our uh, server crashed and we lost everything, and we decided not to like go through the process of trying to. Uh, dig it all up. We I think the last time I updated the news was like 2005. It was around the time the Keeper Legacy album was coming out. Um, but it was something I really enjoyed doing in, in college, and and uh, so it's kind of fun to go back and and kind of curate a web page again. It really does uh, bring back memories. So um, it's cool. Uh, I'm really happy with it, and I'm hoping that it'll grow to be um, a little bit more than just a list of, of all the episodes, but, uh, you know, so far so good. Yeah, I think it looks great. So, uh, thanks for that. Thank you again, uh, to all of our Patreon members, obviously coming off the heels of the mind's eye by dark tranquility by request, lots of, uh, other requests in the queue. In fact, this episode, though, not kind of the first Monday of the month, uh, was actually by request as well. So we're kind of killing two birds with one stone on this. But if you want to make requests or there's albums that you want us to cover, consider joining our Patreon. Uh, if nothing else, you know, get, leave a positive review or tell a friend because it's the best way for people to find uh, find us. And with that being said, I want to just mention a couple of things that I heard this week that kind of caught my ear. The first is uh, German power metal legends Rage came out with their new album uh, earlier this week. I believe it came out last Friday. The album is called Afterlines. It's actually a two CD set. Uh, the first disc is kind of standard fare, new Rage material. The second, they added a lot more symphonic elements um, to the music. Really, really interesting stuff. Two completely separate discs. The reason I bring this up is that there is a song on the first disc called Justice Will Be Mine. I don't know if it was intentional or a nod to somebody else, but I totally heard another song when I listened to this. So I'm going to post it this week, and I'm going to see if anybody kind of picks up on what I heard. So I'll just throw that out there, give this Rage tune a listen, 
and uh, see if it sounds like anything that um, we may have covered in the past, because I found it to be pretty pretty, pretty uh, close to something else. So nonetheless, definitely worth checking out the album if you're a Rage fan. Uh, the the second thing I wanted to mention, and this obviously being on the heels of the Dark Tranquility episode, we finally got to hear new music from Cemetery Skyline, and the song is called Violent Storm. I think we had mentioned this possibly a few weeks back, but this super group was kind of coming together. It features... Uh, members of Insomnium and Amorphous, Dimu Borgir, Sentenced, and of course, Michael Stani from Dark Tranquility and the Halo Effect on vocals. This song has gotten a ton of praise from just about everyone that's heard the thing. I don't really know of anyone that said, I don't care for it, or was even lukewarm. This song was amazing. And, and the way I would describe it is not nearly as... Um, it's not melodic death metal. It's really almost like a gothic rock in the vein of like a typo negative, but just more upbeat. Uh, I don't, I, I'm not even sure if that does it justice, but I have to say if the album is anything like this single, we are in for an absolute treat because I loved this song. Did you, did you have a chance to listen to it? Yeah. And I liked it a lot. It, it reminded me of Lord of the Lost, um, to be honest with you, maybe a little less poppy, but um, it kind of had that that vibe to it, and I was like, I was like surprised when I saw that it was um, the same guy that we were talking about last week. Um, it sounded you know, completely Stani. different. It, yeah, um, but I, I want to hear the rest of this because this is really cool. This is definitely more in my uh, ballpark. But yeah, very cool, very cool tune, and I, I liked it, and I, I thank you for sharing it with me. Yes, I'm glad you liked it, and um, one other album that I'd be worth, uh, I'd be remiss not to mention, uh, German metal band Ivory Tower, after being around for nearly 25 years, but not releasing in anything over the last five, has released their new album, Heavy Rain. I don't even know how I would describe this, because they're kind of proggy, kind of power metal, but this new album sounds nothing like their prior material. So it's almost like listening to a brand new band. Um, they had some lineup changes for sure. Uh, they have a guy by the name of Francis Soto on vocals, and Francis Soto is not related to Jeff Scott in any way and sounds absolutely nothing like him. But it's an interesting album. Um, I kind of was hoping for a little bit more, but alas... Um, if you're a fan of the band and you're expecting that old kind of power metal sound, it's not, it's not really that it's more um, straight up metal and, and, and with a vocalist, that's a little raspier and almost channeling channel channeling uh, your land at times. Um, but a poor man's version, but worth checking out. If you're a fan of the band, I'll certainly post a track this week just so people can hear it. Yeah. I saw that they had a new release. I was curious how it was. I haven't heard anything from it as of yet. Um, but it always makes me think of that debut album they did that I, um, that I lifted from the, the radio station that I used to, uh, have a radio show for, uh, along with that mob rules disc that I gave to our friend, Mike. Um, I think I'm it's sure still, he still in his car. Has it. Yeah, it very well, maybe next car. to the, uh, next to the pandemonium CD. <laughs> very good. Very good. Uh, but now it is time to shift to another German band. I feel like we're doing a lot of, uh, traveling around Germany these days, but uh, we're going to go talk about some Ed Guy, and we're going back to Hellfire Club on the heels of its 20th anniversary. I cannot believe that this album came out 20 years ago, but alas, here we are, March 15th, 2004 to be exact. Uh, this was the band's sixth album. We've covered them, one or, I think, twice now in the archives, covering uh, both Vainglory Opera and Theater of Salvation, and now we're back again with their sixth full-length release. I know that this was your choice. Was it because of the anniversary? Was it because it was time to do Ed Guy? Was it a mix of both? What was the catalyst for this choice um, this week? Uh, both of those things and that the fact that our, our mutual friend Nick had uh, requested it as well. Um, I just thought it would be a good way to wrap all those things all into kind of one neat package. Um, I was looking through our uh, list of episodes and it had been at least a little while since we uh, talked about Ed Guy. I believe um, we have covered uh, two of their albums thus far, uh, Vainglory Opera and Theater of Salvation, which were the first two uh, 
Ed Guy albums I ever owned. Um, I wouldn't hear the previous two albums until later on. Um, but uh, this is kind of at a time where, you know, I remember getting Mandrake at Prog Power 3 while the band was performing at Prog Power 3 songs from that album. That was the tour that they were uh, supporting at the time. And we would go on to see them again. And I dare say it was the last time we saw Ed Guy live when they opened for Hammerfall at BB Kings in 2005, uh, where it was me, you and Pat, I remember seeing them and they, and they were supporting Hellfire Club at the time. And I remember hearing a number of these songs live and, and, I remember thinking that some of these songs, I think I ended up enjoying more after hearing them live. Like, cause there's a couple of songs that are kind of, um, I, I'll get into it when we get to it, but I, I, I the, hearing them live, I think just br- breathed new life into them for me. Um, I want to, I want to pull up the, um, the set list from that night. Um, God, it feels like an eternity ago that we actually would see Ed Guy playing at BB uh, Kings. I guess it wasn't the it was the last time I saw them. They came back a couple of times during the Rocket Ride tour, so maybe you had seen them again. But I think that the that show um, during the Hellfire tour was the last time I saw them, and they would play. Um, King of Fools, Lavatory Love Machine, Mysteria, Navigator, and Under the Moon uh, from from this album, and then a handful of tracks from their previous album. And I just remember thinking to myself, like, as much as I like Hammerfall, I would much rather see Ed Guy headline the show and and play a bit of a longer set. They played like eleven uh, songs, which was kind of a, I feel like a tease uh, for me. So um, I don't think I ever saw them again after this. I think. I may have only ever just seen them the two times, the one at the Prague Power 3 and then again at, at uh, that show opening for Hammerfall in New York City, unless I'm forgetting. But, uh, boy, I wish I had seen them more times knowing how infrequent or possibly never again uh, the band has toured over the last few years. Um, but, yeah, this is uh, this is an album that I always remembered liking a lot, Um potentially one of my favorite uh, of all of their albums. And in retrospect, kind of a, to me, it's kind of like the last of the classic era of of Ed guy. Um, And and I will delve, uh, delve into that. But um, what, what were your memories of this album and when it came out and, and your kind of thoughts about it uh, headed like before, you know, we start before I told you we were going to talk about it. So let me just touch upon one thing you mentioned. I remember that show with Hammerfall vividly because I will never forget the line that uh, it was two and one sixth lawyers that were watching the show because it was after your first semester of law school and ultimately your last semester of law school for reasons I won't delve into on the podcast, but that always struck a chord with me. I would see the band again. I I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, in 2008, they wound up playing New York City again. And they had played one other time um, in between, but they they played in 2008 uh, with a band called Camelot. And at the time, Roy Kahn was doing his last tour with the band. So I vividly remember seeing that show. And uh, ironically enough, it was Camelot that headlined and, and Ed Guy kind of was direct support. So a lot had obviously changed. And, and I think it's due in part to a couple of things. By 2008, I'm just kind of going ahead a little bit. Avantasia had kind of taken off at this point, And Ed Guy's style had changed. And you mentioned it, you know, just moments ago. You had that classic Ed Guy sound, that power metal sound. By 2008, they had kind of deviated from that and they would go with a more hard rock or you know straight up metal sound which was fine although not really my taste per se but i would argue that you actually start hearing just hints of it in in spots on this particular album so we often talk about transitional albums and albums that were seminal albums for the band this was a transitional album in many ways i think it was a very 
interesting blend of the Mandrake era and the Theater of Salvation era, which preceded it, and then the Rocket Ride and the stuff that would come after that for the band. So this album, in terms of my initial thoughts when I heard we were talking about it, I forgot about the album. And, and, and really, because I always kind of thought Mandrake was the last tried and true Ed Guy album, and I thought that this was a bit of a transition. What I forgot was how much it's kind of split. There's half of the songs really are in that old style, and then the other half of the songs are kind of, you know, moving on or evolving, if you will. And so I thought the album was much better than I remembered it being. In fact, much, much better. So much so that I almost think I was a fool, no pun intended, for not kind of falling in love with the album when I first heard it in 2004. I was a massive fan of the band, but for some reason, this album, I don't remember it being as good as it was this week. And there are times where I'll go back to things and maybe it's a little bit stale for me. This was like breathing new life into the album. That's It was it was much better than I expected it to be. I, I had very modest expectations of an album that I thought I might enjoy parts of it, but overall it would just be good. It was better than good, and I actually enjoyed it quite a bit. Well, I think that provides a nice uh, segue to our friend uh, Nick, uh, who provided us with a little bit of a blurb as to uh, why he requested this album. And, and uh, he, too... Has uh, says, I came to the Hellfire Club party very late. I had been listening to another metal album that the guys had covered on the podcast a while back, and after it ended, my music app began playing similar music. A few tracks in, and We Don't Need a Hero completely took me out of my workout. Thinking it was an Avantasia track I had never heard, I was happy to see that it was, in fact, from an Ed Guy album I had missed out on. Like Chris, I had a period around the time this album came out where my listening had shifted away from metal, and I just never came back to this one in the years that had followed. Better late than never, because this album is stellar. It's a great mix of more traditional Ed Guy bangers and power metal anthems to throw your fist in the air and sing along with. The Piper Never Dies may be the best example of this, a 10-minute epic that probably could have been half as long and yet still seems fresh and leaves you wanting more by the end. This album is a testament to the power of simplicity in songwriting. Not to take anything away from the playing or singing, it's great, but these songs are fairly straightforward, tight, and infectious. Toby brings his dependable spark to each of the tracks, and I especially appreciate the live orchestra in place of what would otherwise be keyboards or samples on some of these tracks. In my dream world, this would be the norm, and it would and it breathes so much warmth and life into this album. Lavatory, Love Machine, and Lucifer in Love are forgivable head scratchers for me on an album that otherwise doesn't miss a beat. So... Uh, thank you, Nick, that, for that very eloquent um, blurb. Um, and uh, yeah, I uh, this definitely was a time for me where I was kind of, you know, on the outs with metal, so to speak. But there were certain bands that were just like, they were always going to be uh, at my attention. You know, Halloween, obviously, is one of them. And Ed Guy was another one where it was just kind of like, all right, I might not listen to like new bands that are coming around the pike that Justin might be telling me about like Opeth and Pain of Salvation and, and, and you know, that, that kind of thing. But I'll always go back to the trusty Ed Guy. Um, it, it was really more the, the, the following two albums that, that I kind of, I, I'll be honest, like I didn't really listen to them that, much um and i don't know if it was because i just they didn't pull me in but uh rocket ride and tinnitus sanctus um for whatever reason um and and again it it was during that kind of the timing is is makes complete sense 2006 and 2008 was really kind of like the lost years for me by the time age of the joker came out in 2011 like i was back on the the bandwagon and i remember listening to this album quite a bit and liking it quite a bit too and i i liked space police from 2014 even more than that so um i i don't want to say that i think rocket ride and tinnitus sanctus are worse albums or the two worst ed guy albums because i just don't really know them that well but i also wonder if there's a reason why i didn't go back to those albums either I just feel like they kind of went a little bit more uh, down the, the the comic, the comical route, which I think we'll see, like you said, the Lavatory Love Machine in particular kind of is like a preview of, of that kind of um, 
uh, flavor, I guess, or whatever, like kind of thematic thing where the, the band would become a little bit less serious. And maybe that's because of Avantasia. They could kind of focus or Toby can focus more of his seriousness towards that and then kind of be a little bit, a little bit more playful, uh, with, with Ed guy. But, um, you know, then again, there was a song about, um, high speed alien drum bunnies on the previous album. So maybe, <laughs> maybe there you always was a little taste of that before, I suppose. Yeah. So yeah, it's an interesting I, time period. So it is. And, and I, it's funny how you call it the lost years. I would say for you, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say certainly uh, maybe 2002, but certainly by 2003, from 2003 until probably 2010, those seven years are just, you kind of stop listening to new stuff like you mentioned. So I, I think I'm going to make it a personal challenge to pick some new bands that you may not have heard from that era, just because it would be stuff that I know you haven't heard that I know you missed out on bands like Thunderstone come to mind that I just was eating that stuff up during that time period. You probably have never heard, but for a song or two. So there's some, there's some good stuff from that period but much like yourself, by the time the band got to Tonight of Sanctus in 2008, I had been disenchanted in many ways with the band. I thought the album was kind of, well, it was very weak. And I think I listened to it twice and I, and I haven't touched it in 15 years just because it did not grab me. It kind of turned me off in many ways. And I just couldn't believe that this was the same band that had been releasing such quality stuff. You know, just I don't also prior. remember... I don't remember like people being like, you got to go listen to this either. And so that no, probably is part of it too. Yeah. There's really nothing. I'm, I'm looking at the track listing on that album and nothing stands out. I don't remember it. And I just to this day had no desire to go back to it. I'm sure at some point we'll cover it, but uh, I'm not, I'm not clamoring for that. I just didn't think it was that good. But then, like I said, this album, this album resonated with me a lot more than I thought it was, or at least the perception that I had. And to be clear, you know, we, we talk about Tobias Samet. Obviously, he wrote all the lyrics. He wrote, you know, the bulk of the music here. But the band is is still firmly intact at this point. It's Jens Ludwig, who, uh, you know, was, we had on the Metal Exchange um, not too long ago on guitars, Dirk Sauer on guitars as well, Tobias Exel on bass, and Felix Bonk on drums, now the drummer for Jeff Tate, of all of all people. But um, it's it's the classic Ed Guy lineup, but they, uh, to their credit, I suppose, they began to evolve on this one, but not stray so much from the formula that you thought it was almost a different band. That's, uh, I think that's a really well put, and, and I would uh, agree pretty much uh, 100% with that. Nice. So that being said, I think we should uh, get get into it, shall we? Um, this album kicks off with a song called Mysteria. And it's, it's interesting, in my opinion, for a, a number of reasons, not least of which uh, the bonus version of this track, which is really interesting to me. And I'll get to that momentarily. But this thing starts off with a bang. It's heavy. It's got those crunchy guitar riffs. And although the verses actually remind me almost of a Judas Priest's painkiller, the chorus has that big traditional Ed Guy sound, which you kind of, you know, if you, if you love the albums that came before it, you're going to love the chorus on this one. I think Toby sounds exceptional by this point in his, you know, kind of in his career. He's really found a groove in terms of his vocal stylings, and he had certainly come into his own, and he kind of lost that childhood quality that was on some of those earlier releases where he clearly sounded like a kid trying to sing power metal by now i think he had kind of matured a bit and um when they oh and you i'm glad you mentioned the bb king show um i remember them opening the show with this song and thinking to myself wow it's a lot better than it was on the album they it just had this extra power to it Really, really cool. And and just to kind of put a bow on it, I mentioned the bonus for track version of this. It features Millie uh, Petroza from Creator on guest vocals. So just hearing him and that, you know, the, one of the gods of thrash, who I didn't even know at the time, mind you, but hearing him sing this version, it was awesome. So I hope you went back and listened to that version of it because it was really cool to hear him sing on this. I remember it being, I want to say like at the time it was like billed as like Mysteria, like aggressive version or like Mysteria. I, I forgot. It had like some, 
something. And I always thought like, oh, wow, this vocalist is uh, a little bit more, or yeah, aggressive would be the, the word for it. Um, raspier. Uh, it was kind of c- cool. And uh, yeah, I too had no idea who it was at the time. I don't think that it actually, I'm trying to remember if my copy of the album, unfortunately all my records or my CDs are in storage now, but um, I can't remember if my copy of the album had, the bonus tracks on it or not. Um, but I just, for some reason that sticks out in my head that they had that alternate version of, of Mysteria, but yeah, this is a really just um, great way to kick things off. It's just a very high energy song. Some really um, like belting out vocals to, to kick things off. Like, I don't know that Tobias would be in a, a big hurry to perform this song live nowadays. Um, I, I had, it was funny. Um, I, if you ever watched, there's a, uh, a DVD. I can't remember if it was the, um, the effing with fire or if it was, it might've been cause there was a documentary that was included on that DVD. And he was just talking about how um, like a lot of, building the set list revolved around singing, uh, being able to perform songs that he was like physically capable of singing. Um, and that there were songs that like, you know, people had been clamoring for. And he's like, there's no effing way that I'm going to even try to night after night sing a song like this. I'm wondering if uh, nowadays this might be one of them or he would have to tone down some of the uh, heavy vocals or maybe they get, you know, creator to go on tour with them and they can have uh, Millie come mm-hmm. in and, and do the work for him. But um I just think this is a really killer opening track, and Ed Guy does seem to have a penchant for having really good opening tracks on their albums uh, up until this point. Um, but it, it seems like after, you know, um, Vain Glory Opera and Theater of Salvation, they kind of did away with the, the power metal tropey minute and a half, like, instrumental intro track um, because, you know, they, they opened – mandrake right up with tears of a mandrake and they open this one right up with with mysteria so um i kind of like the idea of just getting right to the point yeah it's 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 a it's a nice contrast i think to the piper never dies and nick alluded to it in his blurb ed guy is known for doing some of these long um epic tunes i just don't recall them ever doing it up front like this on an album and to be you know, when I when I think about the Piper Never Dies, this is really what more of like Avantasia turned into more than it was what Ed Guy was at this point. So like, it was interesting to me when we went back and heard it. I, I forgot. I remembered the song. I just forgot that it was on the album. If that makes sense, and I, that was happening to me a lot. Like I remembered and recognized a lot of these songs, although I haven't heard them in many years. What was interesting to me was that. I just, I guess I just forgot that it was all in one package or whatever, but this song is so good. And it reminds me of like some of the stuff that, you know, like I said, that Avantasia would still be doing today. Like you could put this song on an Avantasia album and you'd be like, well, it makes complete sense that this is on there. It's, this is the epic Avantasia tune. And th- th- that's really what it is. It starts off soft with this almost bluesy guitar and then eventually those big riffs kick in yet again. It's it's much slower paced, but it's really, really enjoyable, especially the keyboards and the bass guitar that play off each other in spots. I never really noticed some of the nuances on this track as I did this particular week. Um, and then you have this piano interlude in the middle. And then the song really takes off after an awesome bridge. And I think that the second half of the song is even better than the first half. And that is not to say I didn't enjoy the first half. I just think it's really two separate and distinct songs thrown together perfectly. Easily could have been my song of the week, although I'll put it in the top three for for me, but I'm going to go in a different direction. You know, I have this recollection of hearing this song live at some point, so it's possible that I did see Ed Guy maybe another time that I'm just forgetting about because they did not play this song when we saw them uh, with Pat. Um, and I believe that the exact quote was th- three lawyers singing, le- singing, let the hammer fall. Uh, and he, just the incredulous look on his face um, will forever be stuck in my, in my memory. And, and you're right with revisionist history. It is two and one, one sixth lawyer, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, this, I remember not loving this song when I first got the album. I thought that it was 
kind of like a little bit long winded for like the second track to have like this kind of 10 minute mid tempo. I don't know. I thought it kind of like broke up the, the speed, but now in retrospect, it's like, this is actually perfect. Um, Cause the next couple of tracks are really going to tear. So like this is actually kind of a perfect track to kind of like calm things down after mis- the wild Mysteria. Um, I, this is a fantastic song. I think Nick said a, like really great that like you know it's a 10 minute song it doesn't overstay its welcome even though it, it's not like theater of salvation where it was like this epic kind of song that was like built had different parts to it and and it just kind of like built up in a different way and th- this is kind of a different tune i think even like the the keys that they use almost has like a kind of arion kind of <laughs> vibe to them which is kind of uh, ironic it, it, after you know, the album we covered just a couple of weeks ago, but I definitely got like, you know, um, Aryan keyboard love. I don't know if he was sharing his patches at this time or what, but, uh, I think this is a really cool, cool tune. And, um, this is a song I could see them playing live now because I don't think it's too strenuous, uh, for any of the musicians, because it really is just kind of a mid tempo, easygoing song, but it really is, uh, really catchy. And then I always talk about like, I think it's difficult. It's hard to make interesting mid-tempo power metal songs sometimes. Um, it's, I think it's easier to make a banger or a, a, a power ballad. Um, and I think that this is just Ed guys showing that like they have more layers to them. So uh, I, def- this is definitely a song that's, I think is, appears to have grown on both of us over the, over time. No question. And I always wondered and, and was almost upset by the fact that the, this band never really changed their set list month much. They'd incorporate one or two or three new songs into a set list. You'd maybe lose one or two of the older songs, but for the most part, they would always play the same songs from the same albums by and large. Your explanation earlier that he was just not able to sing some of this stuff, you know, six out of seven nights in a row would make complete sense. And I actually feel better about it. I wonder if that's what Roy Khan chose to do with some of the Camelot stuff because Camelot set list and, and even, and even, um, you know, even now with Tommy, I, I just think that there's a chance that maybe it comes back to not even being able to sing certain songs night in and night out because it's too taxing. That actually makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. I, I mean, and think about it, like the Avantasia tours, he only has to do like half of the lifting, which is great for him because he's got like a whole all-star cast to, to kind of help out with things, you know, why sing when you have, you know, Michael Kisk and Yorn Land <laughs> on, on tour with you, you know, just point to your left and point to your right. I think you'll be uh, in good shape. Yeah, hell, I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I know Nick was a fan of, we don't need a hero. It was kind of what helped him, you know, kind of latch onto this album. What are your thoughts on that tune? Oh, this is one of my uh, favorite stories. One of my favorite songs by this band. Um, I was telling Nick um, that I was going to have a, a real <laughs> difficult time choosing a track of the week uh, because there's so many songs on this album, at least probably four or five that I think w- would be worthy. And this is one of them. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, Nick said that this would be his song of the week. So I'm going to give Nick a, a minute of this track, unless it's your song of the week too. Um, I'm going to give the, a minute of this to, to Nick and, and pick something else. Um, but this was definitely one of my, uh, one of my runners up of many. <laughs> there was just, there's just, I, 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 I'm thinking of probably four that I, um, yeah, this, this and three other tracks, I, I had a very difficult time choosing between. But um, if it is your song of the week, speak up. Otherwise, I will uh, play a minute of it and we'll come back. It is not. So let's give it a listen and I'll tell you why it isn't when we come back.
great tune. Totally understand why it's in contention. Um, but there was just something else that I knew, knew I was going to select it at a certain point during the week. So we'll get to that later. This one is really keyboard laden at the front. So I know that that probably hooked you in immediately. It's really fast, double bass drum heavy. This reminds me of something that was basically could have been on Vainglory Opera, but was just more polished by this point with much better production. Uh, great, great verses um, that, I, that I would argue even overshadow the chorus on this, which is an impressive feat because usually it's the chorus that does the, the heavy lifting on that end. Toby sounds fantastic. And the drums, the drums on this track really stand out. I was listening to it in the car at one point, and then I kind of had to stop. I'm like, I cannot drive and drum at the same time bad idea <laughs> but i totally was getting into it and I, I i appreciate this song a lot um it's a good one it's a banger it's a good one just not my choice yeah i mean what i don't know that i could add anything to that as well well put um just a really killer tune and um back when i was making playlists like annually which is insane to think um this was on my 2004 mix and sure enough uh my 2005 mix would be the last one i would make for a few years so i mean that just goes to show you how that was the lost era i think i the next playlist i made was like in 2010 so i took a little bit of a break there but um i made a double one in 2004 or sorry 2005 after you had recommended a whole slew of bands that like i was just there was this like whole influx of new stuff, but I remember I added uh, down to the devil, which is the next track to that uh, two disc compilation from 2005. I think if I shared that with you, you'd get a kick out of it just because you had a lot to do with uh, what ended up uh, on that mix. But um, I guess at that point, yeah, Rocket Ride hadn't come out yet, so it was only natural that I would just pick something else from Hellfire Club, even though I had used, um, you know, We Don't Need a Hero the prior year. Um, this is another song that I think just really kicks ass. It, it, it starts out really unassuming and then just pops in and, and just goes, and it's a, another one that... Um, was a runner up for me as well. Um, but I'm, go I think I, when I, I, when I first started listening to this album this past week, I think I was convinced this was going to be it. And then I got kind of slapped upside the head by a couple other tracks that I remembered, but didn't remember how good they were. So I'm going to, I'm going to take a, a pass on this one, although it is in my top four on this album. Like this is, Ed Guy, I think, just hit a a peak with this album where they were just writing some of the best power metal tunes of, of their career and some of the best in in power metal history. And these this one and the previous one are up there for me. Like I like this song an awful lot. I, everything about it is just catchy as hell and, and it's just a really great tune. And the fact that it's not my song of the week just speaks to the the quality of the rest of the album. I'm gonna disagree. I don't love this song. It's fine. I wouldn't skip it. It's enjoyable enough. I just think that the problem for me is that this was a blend of the old power metal sound and the newer hard rock sound. And while I can appreciate the different contrast on the album, I'm not sure that they needed to be in the same song. And so what you got were some verses that were a bit vanilla to me and then a decent chorus. Um, but I don't know, like these, other than the, the, the bass drum line, the bass drum parts, which were kind of, sorry, the bass lines, right? They were simple, kind of unassuming, but really, really cool. But there was just like this paint by numbers feel to it that for whatever reason, I didn't love. It was like, all right, verse, chorus, insert a solo, keyboard interlude, bridge, back to the verse. I mean, it just, something about it I just didn't love. I, I'm not criticizing your opinion. I just think that there's so much better material on here that it got overshadowed by some of the other s songs on the disc. Okay. It's okay. You can, you're allowed to be wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's all good. Like it's, you listen, it, we're not going to agree on everything, but um, yeah, this was just always just one of my favorite tracks. And I think that it was one of the ones that really, um, 
stood out to me when I first got the album. And so it always kind of rang true for me. Um, but I believe it was the, the next track that was the first track from this album that saw the light of day. Uh, if, if I'm trying to see if I can figure out, um, if this, I believe the King of Fools single preceded the album by, yeah, by about a month. Um, the, the King of Fools single came out on February 2nd of 2004, whereas the album was released on March 15th. So this was kind of like a little bit of a, uh, a preview of what would be to come on this album. Um, it didn't have any other tracks on it that actually ended up on the album. There were four non-album tracks, which is, is kind of cool. Like usually a single that precedes an album would have at least one other track from that album. And in, and in this case, they were like, I think that they wanted you to kind of buy this, this, I guess, I think it was, it was marketed as an EP actually, not really a, a single. And we're going to talk about the other tracks uh, towards the back end of the episode. But um what are your thoughts on, on this song? I feel like this is um, a track that kind of goes back to the the more mid tempo kind of vibe that Ed Guy um, does well. Um, there was, I remember, there was a uh, music video that came along with this. But what are your thoughts on this one? I never really cared for this song back in the day. And it's actually better than I remember it. I don't love it. It's not my favorite song. Um, I think it's more hard rock than it is power metal. But there are some really great keyboards throughout. I think the riffs are really good. And I think it's a much better live tune than it is on disc. Um, It's another song that I think could easily have been on an Avantasia album, potentially. Um, It has the same feel as the track Avantasia from the first Metal Opera album. Not my favorite chorus. Um, it's just because it really doesn't sound particularly fresh to me. But it's better than I remember. D- despite slandering it, it's actually better than I remember um, because I was not a fan of this song. And it's actually pretty good. And I can understand why they chose it as a single. Yeah, I, I kind of feel the same way. I think it's a it's a fine song. It, it definitely doesn't bring the album down. Um, I, I think that after... It's an incredibly strong start with those four, first four tracks. And so this kind of similar to Piper Never Dies, although in a lot less time, uh, kind of brings <laughs> brings things down a notch. And uh, it's definitely along with Lavatory Love Machine, which incidentally is the other single from this album, it kind of has a little bit more of a commercial kind of vibe to it. I don't know that Lavatory Love Machine actually has a commercial kind of vibe, but it really is. It's easily the silliest song on the album. King of Fools definitely, I think, was um, aimed at a more commercial play. I think that it kind of also is indicative of what the band would sound like a bit more on, on the next couple of albums, even though I did admit I don't know them nearly as well as I do some of these other ones, but um, it's a good song. I, I, just, I just don't think it's a great song. Um, and I think that it, it kind of, this is one of the songs that would keep me from giving this, like this album a perfect score as much as I absolutely love the first uh, four tracks. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just come out and say, I don't think this is a perfect album, but um I don't know that there's really anything awful on it either. So, um, yeah, well, solitude. We'll I get definitely, there. We'll get there. Yeah, I definitely recommend. Uh, I recommend if you've never seen the music video to hop onto YouTube and, and check it out. It's definitely uh, got a fun kind of mid aughts <laughs> kind of vibe to it. Um, so yeah, you know, I, it, I kind of take it as like the uh, the the music video slash single song that you know is like the necessary evil, I guess. But I mean, again, it's a, it's a pretty good, it's a good song. It's just not, I don't think it holds up with the, the previous four. Well, we move on to forever. Uh, the first true ballad, and it's not a Stradivarius cover. Quite frankly, it's probably not as good as their version of forever um, from episode, but this is a really good ballad. Um, the acoustic guitars actually remind me of Scarlet Rose, um, a song that we talked about back in the day when we talked about um, Being Glory Opera. I never really noticed how much the orchestration on this really popped. And it actually plays a rather large part. And to Nick's point from earlier, it's great that they actually used a real orchestra to do it. Because I think that on a track like this, it does make a world of difference. 
um, the, the, the song would kind of evolve into power ballad territory with a beautiful chorus where, you know, get your lighters out and, and, and let's go. Um, but I, I, I like the contrast between these big, powerful, ver- uh, vo- you know, choruses and then these kind of softer sounding acoustic verses. I like the contrast. I like the song a lot. And um, to me, it's a step back in the right direction. Yeah, Nick actually was the one who told me that the orchestra, where it's located on this album, it's at the end of We Don't Need a Hero and the back half of, of this track. And that was one of the things that he mentioned he really likes. And as somebody who composes music, I can understand why he would uh, feel that way. Um, but yeah, I think this is a... Ed Guy definitely never been a slouch in the power ballad area. And I've always, I was always a sucker for Scarlet Rose and... Uh, for a trace of life is another uh, one of my favorites. Um, they didn't write a ton of power ballads, but when they did, they were very good. And this is no uh, no exception. So good stuff. And uh, I don't know if it's too much of a you know uh, too much of a throwback to Land of the Miracle. I think it's kind of got as its own flavor, um, but. Um, yeah, I would say this along with, uh, you know, this and Land of the Miracle and Scarlet Rose, probably my three favorite Ed Guy uh, ballads. Yeah, I think that uh, I think that makes sense. Um, what I will say is that there's no better way to kind of follow up a, a ballad than with a real banger of a tune, and we get to Under the Moon. I don't really rem- – I didn't really remember this – track shame on me shame on me because the second i heard this song i'm like oh boy i just strap in this song is outstanding far and away my favorite on the disc and i do like piper and some of the other tracks on here but the second i heard this song i was blown away it was like I had an epiphany of sorts when I was listening to it. Um, I'll get into the details, but this is my song of the week just so I can hear it again. That's how much I love this tune. And it's so well placed after the ballad. It was brilliant to put this song where they did um, to kind of kickstart the second half of the album. But uh, let's give Under the Moon a listen and I'll, I'll share some more thoughts. And I, I certainly want to hear yours as well. This song is so catchy. I I would not say it's the most innovative thing in the world. I'm not going to say that you haven't heard other bands do, you know, rockers like this, but the vocals are great. The guitar work is great. And it is the catchiest chorus on the album. It's been stuck in my head all week. Um, I'm not sure it really gets much better as far as Ed Guy goes. And I'm sure nobody ever talks about this, but the reality is, the bass lines on this song, to- Tobias Axel's bass lines are phenomenal. And they're like just so subtle. But when you hear them, it's they really pop. Great tune. Great tune. Um, I'm sure you like it. My only question is, was it your song of the week as well? <laughs> well, it was like I was still trying to figure out between this and something else. And you made it easier for me to just choose the other one. But it was really between this and... And uh, something else. But yeah, this song is incredible. Oh, well, I know what the other one is. I can guess. I'm, but we'll... I'm looking at the set list from BB Kings that we were together at, and they opened with this song. I don't even I don't even remember that. Like, wow, that's, that's crazy to me. Like, um, 
I mean, it's an, it's, I mean, what better song to open with? What a great tune. But, um, I agree with you. It's a great, great placement after the power ballad just to kick things off again and just kind of have a really fast paced traditional power metal song before the, um, the comedy track that will follow. But, um, yeah, this song is an absolute banger and I'm with you. Like I kind of forgot about it too. And as soon as I heard it, I was like, Oh yeah, I forgot about this song. Like shame on me too. Cause this song is a friggin' banger, like just a great choice. And, uh, I'm glad that you, you chose it cause it gives me the opportunity to, to kind of double dip, really triple dip with, uh, Nick's pick too. So, um, it's, when I dip, you dip, we dip. I mean, that's yeah. where we're at at this point. Yeah. S- said by, said by a true dip. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, lavatory love machine. I, I, I don't know what to say about this. This is not much more subtle than something Steel Panther would do. It is a hard rock tune that has always missed the mark for me. It's a little uh, more subtle than Steel Panther. Come on. Eh, is it really? T- uh, Toby's vocals are a highlight, but at the same time, I-, I don't think the verses are very good. The chorus is downright terrible, and I know the band admits that it kind of started as a joke, and it was actually Sasha Paith, the producer, that told him to put it on the album. It is a it is a it is a black mark on this thing. I don't mind the joke. I just don't think it's a particularly good song. Maybe you like it more than I do, but um, you know, it's uh, it, it's just not for me. I, I, this song, I just it it's like a a time machine, uh, not a, not a love machine, but a time machine. Yeah. It just brings me back to this time. Like, it, yeah, it kind of doesn't fit the rest of the album but i don't know i think it's fun it's a catchy song it's a blast live um it's it's never going to be my favorite song on this album but um i don't know it doesn't really bother me yeah it's cheesy as hell the music video is hysterical um i don't know i i don't i don't really have a big issue with this song um i just think that it kind of it doesn't hold up to like all the previous songs i had mentioned that i like so much but um it's fine for what it is. Um, it has just that kind of Ed guy charm to it. Um, that, uh, just is the band showing that, uh, you know, that they, they don't take themselves too seriously. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't dislike the song at all. It, it's every time I hear it, it kind of just reminds me of when I first heard it and how, humorous i thought it was when i was you know 22 years old or whatever i think it gets the nostalgia pop from you but i have a feeling that if you heard it today for the first time you might have a different opinion yeah well like you said like you know steel panthers doing it a lot uh a lot more uh egregiously and uh you know less subtly so um you know i I can always go that route if i need if i need to get my, my my raunch in but uh this is this is this is fine. I mean, I, I don't mind that it's a goofy track because at least it's catchy. If it was goofy and it, the song sucked, then then it's kind of like the joke is is wasted on a shitty song. So, uh, but it, it certainly is no rise of the morning glory, which will be my song of the week. Uh, just mm. another triumphant, majestic wonderful <laughs> song. <laughs> I, like I swear, like um, I know that, um, you know, Ed guy released this monuments, um, you know, kind of a greatest hits compilation album, man. If I was to make a best of Ed guy, which I'm pretty sure I have before, I'll have to dig that one up. Um, there would be so many more and different songs from this album that would be on it. And this along with under the moon and we don't need a hero and down to the devil all would be on that. But this is just another, Oh, it's just, it's just Ed guy doing what they do best. And it just has such a, a, the, just a, it just feels like a positive song. The melody is just so catchy. Uh, this was like Ed guy's peak of, of earwormdom. Uh, just, just a great tune. So, uh, I have a feeling you saw this one coming, uh, well, after, after Under the Moon, but, uh, let's give it a, a listen and, uh, I, I look forward to hearing what you have to say about it.
I'm actually a little surprised that this was your track of the week. If for no other reason than I thought you were going to go with another song uh, later on. This begins almost like another ballad with that acoustic guitar, but it quickly revs up fast. And it has that, as I was listening to it, I kept thinking this is the song with the metal exchange gallop on full display, that chugga chug chug sound. And it has a really big chorus, which is the highlight for me. And I know you're a sucker for a big chorus, so it does make sense. Um, but what really stood out more than anything, I think, was that this track is an is emblematic of the great production on this album. The band sounds so much better. And this, I should note, is their first album on Nuclear Blast. And I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but at the end of the day, this just sounds better than Vain Glory Opera. And, and although I think the sound on Theater of Salvation is quite good, and I think the sound on Mandrake is good, I think that this was even a step up from both of those albums. So sonically very pleasing, um, and I can certainly appreciate why you picked it. I'm glad you did not pick the next interlude, Lucifer in Love, um, <laughs> where you get to hear him enjoying the pleasures of life for 30 seconds with a piano in the background. It's short. I don't know what else to say other than, thankfully, it's not longer than about 30 seconds because it is <laughs> it is just ridiculous. Um, I, what I did think you were going to choose was Navigator. I was a little surprised that you didn't choose this song. This was top three for me and, and the other song that was in contention. And it reminds me of early Queensryche, which is probably the first and only time I will compare Ed Guy to Queensryche. But this song has it. And it has an epic feel like Piper, but not as dense and, and overblown, I guess. Really great verses, a phenomenal chorus, both of which have a very big feel to it. And I just love the little guitar solo after the first chorus. And, and in many ways, it has a retro feel, which is why I think I get a Queensryche vibe from it. It's, the song feels longer than it actually is, but I don't mean that in a bad way. It actually just has this big, grandiose nature to it that I loved. Um, really good tune. What are, what are your thoughts on Navigator? Yeah, this I like this one a lot too. And again, it, it's just you know another ver, another uh, example of Ed Guy like really crushing a a more mid tempo kind of song. This is the song that they did play the last time I saw them. It was actually the next song after Under the Moon, as it turns out. And I remember being more impressed with the song after hearing it live. Um, and now, like in, in retrospect, I, I really I really like it quite a bit. It, it's one of the three tracks on the album that um, Jens Ludwig has co-songwriting credit on with Tobias, uh, along with Mysteria and Under the Moon. Um, but yeah, this is really just an epic tune. I remember it being longer. I feel like I may have gotten like the, my wires crossed with this and, and Piper Never Dies because they're the two kind of mid-tempo, like epic kind of feeling um, songs. Uh, but um, th this is another... Uh, another really good tune on an album full of them. Um, that's what I like about Ed Guy is that like, as much as I gravitate towards the under the moons and the rise of the morning glories of the world, I, I really enjoy their songs that are kind of mid tempo as well. I mean, even when you like go back and you think about songs like, um, you know, the headless game, um, they just they do like the mid tempo thing so well that like you don't it, do, it doesn't leave you wanting for the faster songs or the power ballads so um really good tune i i argue it it maybe could have even been the uh the final track on the the album proper not counting the the handful of uh, bonus tracks but um instead we get the uh the spirit will remain which it, it's it doesn't even feel like a, a full song for some reason, even though it's like a four minute track, it almost has like this outro kind of um, vibe to it. Um, it's not yeah. bad. It's just kind it of an odd way to, to end just didn't need to be on there. Right. It's very Celtic sounding it has a lot of symphonic elements to it, which I mean, it's well done, but like, I don't know. I didn't need a game of Thrones piece to end this. And that's really <laughs> what I got. And, and so I don't know the, all hail the red queen. I'm not really sure what was going on or what they were thinking, but uh, 
the song goes out and then, and you move on. But um, an interesting, interesting album. I want to talk about the bonus tracks, but do you want to rate it now or shall we wait, we're, you know, wait until we talk about uh, some of these songs that are on the EP and whatnot? No, let's make them wait. Make them wait. All right. So I talked a little bit about the Mysteria um, version with, with Millie, which was interesting. They do a song called Children of Steel, which is actually from their first demo tape from 1994. You can tell that this song is very elementary in its songwriting, and it's kind of cool that they kind of dusted it off and, and put it on this album and remade it. I'm not a huge fan of it. It's fine. I think the chorus is very weak. But the verses and even the pre-chorus are quite enjoyable, and it's just, I think, a testament to the improvement of their songwriting over time. But it was an interesting choice to get on here. Yeah, I, I like this tune, and and I, I was always kind of yearning for um, like kind of remakes of some of their older stuff. Um, you know, they re-recorded uh, "Wings of a Dream," which was a track from kingdom of madness and they re-recorded that during the mandrake sessions and i really enjoyed that updated version of that and then they went and re-recorded all of their first album uh savage poetry which like with a little bit of polish you realize that the band even before vainglory opera like had some songwriting chops because these songs are really quite good um and you know like i said a little polish goes a long way this this one you could definitely tell there's a little bit more of a rawness to it but i think that the 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 hellfire club polish kind of gives it a little bit more it makes it feel a little bit more mature i guess and uh it's a good it's a fun little bonus uh to have to have on here so um yeah it's 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 cool um the other bonus track on the actual album proper is a song that i just recently grabbed i had never heard it before it's called heavenward and it's really just a um demo version of navigator and i still haven't listened to it so you'll have to have you had a chance to hear this because it was new to me i never even knew this song existed yeah it's just a similar version of navigator it sounds you know sounds like a demo it's it's more uh you know a little bit more rough sounding although it does sound like it probably could have been on <laughs> the inglory opera kingdom of madness um that's that, that's how far ed guy's gone that their demo material was starting to sound like their earlier albums at least in production quality but um uh, you're not really missing t- too much if you're aware of navigator then this is more or less the same thing with a little bit of um changes here and there sounds good uh i will i will check it out but let's just talk about some of the front side or some of the back side of the the king of fools ep there's some really good songs on here that could have easily been on the album proper um one of them for sure could not but new age messiah i think could or at least most of it could this one has a really strong avantasia vibe another song with heavy orchestration kind of mid-paced i think the guitars are are phenomenal on this and i like just the cadence to it and it has this very positive sound um that i enjoy the chorus uh, is, is good and i i kind of wonder why it didn't make the album proper um Maybe it's the uh, the bridge with the O O O section. I don't know that it was necessary, you know, and, and kind of cheesy, or possibly the fuckity fuck section, which I think was just completely and wholly unnecessary. But there are elements of this song which are great. Love the song, and uh, I I always wondered why it didn't make it to the album, but maybe, maybe just because like they had done enough silliness and this is kind of a little bit more of a, of a goofier song, but man, I, I think this is one of the more fun songs that they've, re- they recorded during these sessions and it makes oh, like owning the King of Fools EP kind of worth it. Um, I, there's, I think actually it's all worth owning. Um, it's all uh, to me, like all stuff that I think could have been on the, on, on some album on the A side of some album, it really doesn't have that, kind of like leftover crap <laughs> kind of feel that some B sides have or, sure. or they just feel so out of um out of scope with the rest of the album. Um so but I like I think this is probably my favorite track of all of the um all of the extra material that came out of these sessions. Um I always I always had a a, a place in my heart for the song, especially when I 
got the King of Fools EP ahead of a Hellfire Club and thought that this was actually a better song than King of Fools. Um, I was like, maybe this should have been the, the single, but, um, that's just, uh, that's, that's, that's how I feel about it. Um, good tune. And with that brings us to the Savage Union. Um, this was, I think a good B side, although I can understand why they may not have put it on the album. It, it actually reminds me a bit of Saxon in the beginning with the, that opening riff. It has a bit of a throwback feel to it. Um, the verses are fine. I think the chorus is kind of cool with the layered vocals and whatnot. Um, I, I just don't think it's an overwhelming tune. And what I thought was interesting is number one, the, the, the dueling guitar solos, nice touch, but really, there were parts of this that reminded me of Halloween's Pumpkins United. And I never, I wonder if that was an influence to that song. Because there were really, you know, some of these riffs and some of the way that they structure this reminds me of that first Halloween single when they got back together. Could just be me, though. I, I, I don't know. But your thoughts on the Savage Union? It reminded me of a bit of an older uh, Ed Guy sound, um, especially like that opening riff um solid tune i don't like it as much as new age messiah makes reminds me more of the match made in heaven between randy savage and elizabeth at <laughs> SummerSlam 91 um some of you know what i'm talking about most of you don't um, <laughs> but uh that was a pretty savage union you were there um, i was there i was there <laughs> yeah good good song um Probably on the the bottom half of songs, you know, if if I'm including this with the rest of the the full length album, it's probably towards the the bottom. Although that's really not a knock because I just uh, there's really no songs that I that I dislike anywhere in these recordings. Yeah, I I, I think that that makes sense. I I think the weakest of the of the bonus tracks is actually Holy Water, the next one. It's a bit nondescript and, and kind of slow paced. Um, it reminds me, and I don't know why this is, but maybe it's the orchestration, but there are parts of this that remind me of like a 70s TV um, drama, like the Love Boat theme or something like that. I don't know why. I that was a sad reunion. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say. Um, something is is... It was interesting. It's just not my favorite tune. It's pretty good. It's just a little repetitive. Um, any strong thoughts on this? It kind of reminded me of Lost in Space. Uh, not the not the TV show, but the uh, <laughs> the <laughs> Avantasia song. Um, I feel like that it's it's kind of similar, and probably why this ended up being a B side and not um, not really used. I'm trying to figure out if the um, yeah, so the, like this wasn't actually the, the Lost in Space wasn't recorded for Avantasia until after this, so this would have preceded Lost in Space. But I feel like there's a little bit of a parallelism between these two tracks. Uh, it's it's a good tune. Um, I like this one too. It definitely doesn't feel like it would have fit on the Hellfire Club album, though. Even though it's a good tune, it just feels like it's a little bit um, different in tone. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I just think three three pretty solid um b-sides followed by a, a very i think still hilarious joke of a track that um i believe was um like tobias wrote as kind of like a commentary on being asked to write extra songs for these you know particularly these japanese releases um and he just wrote this and was like this is uh this is my bonus track and it's called life and times of a bonus track um this is a comedy track but it's great and what's funny is that at the time i was always jealous of people and not wanting to import albums for 30 dollars 25 years ago and i just remember the first time i heard this i was laughing but it was so nice to hear these ridiculous lyrics over the this this simple piano you know, tune something about this song has always grabbed me. Um, very deep and introspective lyrics, as you can imagine. But kidding aside, just a really awesome bonus track. And I feel like there's nothing better um, than a track that may not take itself too seriously and certainly didn't belong on the album proper, but was a really, really otherwise enjoyable bonus track for what it was. Well, that that um, mix 
CD that I made in 04, um, my, the, I made this actually the last track after We Don't Need a Hero. I just thought nice. it was too fun to not like put on a playlist as the last, uh, the last track. So, um, it, it's really a sign of the times because like the, the, the playlist ends with, uh, Misa Mercuria, Twilightning, Tw- Time Requiem, Advance, and Ed Guy. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, no arguments for me. Lots of good stuff there for sure. Um, I also went back and, oh, excuse me, it's been a long week and it's only Wednesday. Um, <laughs> I went back and I listened to, th- th- they released a couple of acoustic tracks uh, as as additional material for the um, Lavatory Love Machine single. Um, I, I actually think the acoustic version of the Lavatory Love Machine song is really fun. Like, it just gives it a, a totally different kind of, like, more, like, goofy idiots around the bonfire with their guitars and, and tambourines or whatever, just joking around. And, and so I think, um, I thought that was really cool. But the, the, the thing that really stuck out to me was, was that this song I'll cry for you, which is a, a Europe cover is a song. I was not, I don't, I think to this day, I still have never actually heard the, the Europe version of it. I, it's a really fun tune and, uh, it's another, um, another acoustic track, but it's, uh, I think it's a highlight on this little, uh, this little single. Nice. I've never heard that. I'm going to go check it out. Um, new, new to me for sure. I, yep. and they, and they, and they, they, they finish it up with another, um, another power, power ballad called reach out, which, um, I think is fine. It's, it's just okay. But, um, I kind of wanted to cover all of the, all the material from these sessions that, that ended up getting released, um, one way, or another, but there's a lot of good, a lot of good stuff here that didn't make it onto the album proper. I mean, enough that you could pretty much make a, like a bonus disc of, of, of extra stuff, which, nice. Nice. Th- which they did in, Hon- in the Hong Kong uh, version of the album. They released a bonus disc of 13 tracks along with some live stuff. So good, good stuff. I, I, uh, I enjoy the extra stuff. And when we, cover Ed Guy in the future, you know, we'll probably fill in a lot of the blanks on some of this extra stuff just to be completionists. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. What I will ask is on a scale of one to 10, what are you giving this? Um, I'm a little surprised. I'll even kind of lead with this. Arguably better than Vainglory Opera. I don't know that I like it as much as Theater of Salvation, which I gave a nine. It's not a nine to me. I had given Vainglory Opera an eight, and I actually think that when I, with the benefit of hindsight, this might be better. Um, I'm going to give it like an 8.25. It's not perfect, but it's a damn good score, and quite frankly, probably an, uh, at least a point higher than I would have expected to give it going into the week. Um, might be my second favorite Ed Guy album. I haven't listened to Mandrake in a while. I'm sure we will cover that, but it's going to be a stiff competition between this and 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 Mandrake for my second favorite album. Yeah, I as of right now, and yeah, like Mandrake does have like maybe my favorite Ed Guy song ever in Jerusalem, and you know you can point back to this episode if that is not my song of the week when we do that episode, I will be. Uh, just as surprised as you, but um, I actually I think I like this album even a smidge more than Theater of Salvation, which I think I also gave a nine. Um, I'm going to give this one a nine point two five. I definitely wow. agree that it's better than Vainglory Opera. Vainglory Opera, I feel like, hasn't aged as well as I thought it would when I first heard it, and it might have just been because that was like I don't know. Uh, I don't, you know, it might not have been my first Ed Guy album. I think Theater Salvation was, and then I got Being Glory Opera. But either way, I think um, it, it has a little bit of a nostalgia kind of pushing it through. Um, but I think just I, – I think that – I will say that Theater of Salvation might be a more consistent album, but I think Hellfire Club has songs that to me are more memorable at the end of the day that I just – look back on more fondly. And I think for that reason, it kind of pulls up some of the stuff that I don't totally love, but like there really isn't anything that is just 
awful to me on this album. Um, you know, Lucifer in Love was 30 seconds and basically to me is just like the intro to Navigator anyway. So I don't even count that as a, as a song. So, um, that's kind of where I'm at. Like, I, I don't think that it's so strong that I, I would go up to uh, like a 9.5. Um, but, uh, it, it's, it's, it's one of those albums where I, whenever I go back to it, I'm like worried that it won't live up to the expectations I've built up in my mind. And then it always ends up living up to those expectations. And then like, you just get reminded by like songs like under the moon where you're like, Oh shit. Like, yeah, this, um, this is sick. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I really like this one and I'm really curious to see where both of our uh, rankings go when we talk about Mandrake and, and even the, the, the savage poetry, I, I would like to do an episode on at some point on the, um, the re-recorded version of that. I, I think the original version just sounds so raw that it's almost like hard to listen to. Um, and you don't really get, I think the full, uh, you don't appreciate the, the songs as much because of how unpolished it is. Um, it's a struggle. So, it's a struggle to listen to. Yeah. I mean, I even sometimes have a hard time with kingdom of madness and that sounds miles better than the original savage poetry uh, recording. But um that's all uh, well and good for uh, the the future, um, but um, it, it, almost a year uh, to the day that we um, recorded our last Ed Guy episode, uh, which came which dropped on April tenth of twenty twenty three. This one's going to drop on April eighth, so pretty close to it. But I thought it was definitely time, and with the anniversary and everything, it seemed like uh, no better time than the present. Uh, that also means that Nick, uh, you owe us another request. So you want to get good. on? That. We Very called good. out. We called out everybody else last week. So now we have, it's Nick's turn to get called out as well. I like it. I like it. Uh, I just want to mention one news item before I tell you about next week. Um, after 15 years, Dream Theater has finally completed their new album, or at least the writing of their new album with Mike Portnoy. La Brie aside, I know your thoughts, although I, you do say that I like them better in the studio, so I'll give you credit for that. What are your expectations for this album? Do you have high hopes, or do you think this is just going to be um, you know, just another album in their catalog at this point? It's hard to say. Like, I, I guess it really depends on like how much of the songwriting is going to be affected by Portnoy being back in the band. Um, So I don't know, like it's been a very long time. I I would say six degrees of inner turbulence was probably the last dream theater album I was excited about. I don't know that I'm necessarily excited about this, but I'm very curious and I will definitely be checking it out. I mean, I, they, they make Libri sound totally fine in the, in the studio. Um, I don't know that I'll be in a, a big rush to go see them live, but um. I'm definitely curious. Do we know if, is that album a uh, definite release for 2024 or? Uh, Yeah, I believe it is. Although I don't have a date certain. I don't think they're going to be holding this over. I mean, listen, they're finishing up the recording now. Portnoy has laid down the drum tracks. So obviously there's still a lot of work to be done, but assuming it gets done by the middle of the year, it's either coming out late 2024 or early 2025, I would imagine. Well, it sounds good. I will definitely be, uh, I will definitely be checking it out. Um, I just, uh, I don't know. I think I, because of my expectations being kind of non-existent, I wouldn't even call them low. They, I just don't really have any expectations. I have a feeling it'll probably end up taking me by surprise. There you go. Uh, well, I, I'm just, I was curious because um, we had about the new, album and i think it's something we probably should consider covering when the time comes just when that album comes out so food for thought there uh and that brings us to next week we just covered hellfire club's 20th anniversary and as i alluded to last week my selection for this coming week is a 10th anniversary this particular album came out march 31st of 2014 so we're just on the heels of the 10th anniversary and it's a band that we have not covered in long form at all on this podcast so the album is called renatus or renatus the album the band is dynasty and it is a band that 
I really got into with this particular release. I was not very familiar with their stuff before this. And this album just knocked my socks off. And so much so that everything that's come after it has been good. But it never really hit this, which I considered their high watermark. And part of the reason I wanted to go back to it, anniversary aside, was that I wanted to see whether it was going to have the same effect on me as it did 10 years ago when it was... Listen, I'll be honest, I think it was my album of the year. I wasn't keeping track back then, but it would have been because I played this thing over and over and over again um, countless times. So it would have definitely been the best album of that year, I think. I wasn't sure how it was going to hit for me this time, but I'll say this, after having listened to it once, I felt like I went back in time and had that big smile on my face like I did in 2014. So next week, we cover Dynasty's um, fourth full-length studio album, Renatus, um, from 2014. I feel like it's still one of the biggest disappointments as far as cancellations go was the, that they were supposed to play this whole album yes. at Prague Power, and it just never took place. I believe that was a, a Visa situation. Um, it was. I was sponsoring them, and I would have lost my mind to hear this whole album live. The, it, it, again, I've seen the band at Prague Power. I just saw them on 70K, but they didn't touch anything from this album. So as good as the show was, and they were phenomenal, it was missing something because there are some just absolute dynamo tracks on here, which I would put up against anything that's come out in the last decade. And yet they don't touch it. And I know that bands have a propensity to play newer stuff. And, and I certainly understand that with sales and the labels and all that. But it is a missed opportunity that some of this some of this stuff has been lost to time already. I'm really glad that you chose this because I have not listened to this album in a very long time. I mean, it looks like it, it, the last time I listened to the entire thing was in 2017. So <laughs> we're talking a long time. So this is uh, this is exciting. I'm glad that you chose this because I remember loving this. But for whatever reason, just never went back and, and, and kept listening to it. So I'm curious to see if it holds up in the, the, the status that I've always held it so high in my mind. Um, it's been like seven years <laughs> since I've heard it. So it'll be interesting to go back to. But this is a band that I've just really, that was my first taste of them. And I, I've just been such a fan of theirs since then. I've enjoyed um all their albums that they released. Uh, I, I remember really enjoying the follow-up album, Titanic Mass, as well. But um, I was surprised when I found out about it. I thought they were like a brand new band. And then I come to find out that they had like three albums <laughs> prior to, <laughs> to Renato. So I was like, shit, these guys really got a lot of a lot of stuff. So, um, yeah, great choice. I, I'm excited for this. And uh, and then the week after, we'll, we have something special planned. We'll, we'll talk about that next week. Um, but... Uh, this is good stuff. Yeah, I'm excited for this. Nice. So if you like what you hear, as I said earlier, please give us a like and a follow so that uh, other people can help find the show. And uh, we'll come back with more quality uh, reviews or at least some more quality music in the weeks to come and the months to come. So cheers, my friend. This has been uh, a good one. We've gone a little long, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of cut it there. But uh, I look forward to discussing this and uh, revealing the surprise for the following week. Because Especially for our Patreon folks, we've got some cool stuff lined up as it relates to that particular episode. That we do. Enjoy the week, my friend. I will talk to you soon. All right. Take care, buddy.